and welcome to our Sign of Four podcast for today. Our subject is villains and specifically what makes a villain. Who do we, and by we I mean me Miss Earnshaw and me Miss Lifer, who do we personally think is the biggest villain in Sign of Four by Arthur Conan Doyle? Should we start off by talking about what makes a villain then? Yeah, because um, that would be quite good if we're thinking about picking up our AO3 marks, as well as answering a question if it was on villains, um, just to establish exactly what it is that makes a villain. So we, I suppose, brainstormed this, didn't we, before, mm-hmm. and we talked about things like committing evil acts or perhaps having evil thoughts, so they might be criminal acts like murder or they might just be kind of immoral acts. And then even worse... After they've done those things, not having any remorse, not feeling bad about any of those things at all, we thought made a villain. I think more specifically in Sign of Four, the villainous characters tend to have some kind of inherent greed to them. So um, that spans across our kind of most obvious villainous characters, but then also kind of leaks into certain other characters, doesn't it, that might be our kind of fringe villains. I think so. And I think there has to be some kind of plotting and intent behind their acts Yeah, as I well. think a villain can't just accidentally do something a little bit bad and be <laughs> called a villain. It has to be come from a place of kind of want for themselves, maybe. Yeah, and they've got intent behind whatever it is they do. Um, so the main characters will probably end up speaking about Um, in this episode. Our suspects, if you will. Our kind of antagonists, if you Mm. want to start using literary terms, would be Jonathan Small and Tonga. But we're also going to spend some time talking about how we might consider Captain Morstan and Captain Sholto to be kind of secondary villains in this story. We were thinking if we were to break down our revision of these characters in particular and look at where we might find key evidence for their villainy. For Jonathan Small, we might look at chapter five and the discovery of the body of Bartholomew Sholto. Um, Chapter 10, the boat chase. And then obviously chapter 12, Jonathan Small's story. For Tonga, again, we probably look at the body of Bartholomew Sholto as the kind of evidence of his criminal acts. But we've also got the description of the islanders from the Andaman Islands in Chapter 8, where obviously we get that quite rich imagery from Conan Doyle. Slightly racist imagery, would you say? Uh, More than slightly, yes. More than slightly racist imagery, but still kind of ties into this image of a villain that we get for, for Tonga. Um, You could also look at chapter 10 as well for kind of seeing Tonga for the first time. His kind of reveal is quite good for looking at him as a villain. Just before we go on to where we might look for key evidence for um, Captain Morstan and Major Sholto, I was thinking something that ties together both Jonathan Small and Tonga is, I suppose, context alert here, this kind of Victorian belief that um, villainy or evil could be seen there are yes. visible signs of it. And I think in descriptions of both of those characters, we get quite negative details about them. And I think it probably ties into that idea of the other in yeah. kind of quotation marks um, that we get kind of throughout the story where characters that are different to or from a different place are often presented in this kind of negative light. Um, what about for Captain Morstan and Sholto then? Where would you be looking for that? Well, we thought, didn't we, it would be a little bit harder to find the evidence um, of their villainy. But if you're looking to push yourself a bit further, you might look at um, Thaddeus's story in Chapter 3, uh, where we get some subtle clues about his father. Um, I think very much the greed of his father yeah. comes through there, doesn't it? And then, again, so for all three of these suspects, our villains, Jonathan Small's story... So basically, if you want to revise villains, <laughs> definitely reread chapter 12 because it's a it's kind of a hit list, isn't it, for definitely. all of the different reasons we might blame different characters in the story. But what's that we hear you say? You want some key quotes to support any of these ideas? Well, don't worry. That is exactly what we're going to go on and do. And I don't know about you, Miss Angel, but I find it more difficult to learn quotes for Sign of Four. I think because it is a novel, because the lines haven't been written to be memorable for actors like they have in Inspector Calls and in Macbeth. So we are going to look into kind of just a few key quotes for each character that hopefully will stick in your minds were you to get a question on villainy in the summer. But if not, hopefully it will remind you of key moments you can look at and you'll still be able to explain your ideas about them in just as impressive a way. Exactly. So should we start with Jonathan Small? Old Timbertoe. Old Timbertoe, there's a quote for you. Um, 
I'm going to read a quote out and I'd like you to explain oh. what you'd say about it. <laughs> okay. You're the pupil now. All right. So, uh, from chapter 11, uh, we get a description of Jonathan Small. Open quotation marks. His heavy brows and aggressive chin gave him a terrible expression when moved to anger. Close quotation marks. <laughs> quotation. quotation marks. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to talk about it? Now? I'd love for you to talk about it. Bit of AO2, please. Um, okay. Well, I've got some kind of general ideas, but the first thing that strikes me from that are, I think, let me count them, three words in particular that stand out to me that I think I could link together. So, aggressive chin, terrible expression, and move to anger. I think we get that very negative language, aggressive, almost violent uh, language when used to describe him don't you if you think there's a semantic field at work there but I think, I think all be. of those choices work together to give us this idea that just from looking at Jonathan Small you can see his aggressive maybe even violent intent as though his villainy is written all over his face I think it fits in with that Victorian idea that evil is visible on someone's face yeah. ties in with the fact also that of the Victorian idea that um only a lower class or working class person could be a criminal and we know from his story that he is lower class it's almost it's very physical isn't it that yeah. description the heavy brows and aggressive chin giving those kind of emotional aspects to the the physical description of him i think we're not meant to like him no and therefore suspect him of being the villain it's interesting then as a side note that i think sherlock by the end of the novel does kind of like him or if not like him doesn't feel as negatively towards him as you might expect from a detective character. Definitely not. And, well, when we go into Tonga, we might talk about why. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to challenge me now? Go on, then. Okay. Um, let's go to the, the key chapter, then, chapter 12. His own story, from his perspective. I lived only for vengeance, he says. That's a good short quote, I think, to remember. I lived only for vengeance. And I think it, it ties into that key idea that he doesn't feel any remorse for his actions. This, this kind of concept of vengeance is really important to him and all of his actions throughout the novel come to this kind of climax at the end, don't they, where he's wanting to seek this vengeance for this supposed crime that he's had committed against him. Side note, the crime that he feels has been committed is that the treasure is rightfully his through the sign of the four. He kind of acquired it through the murder of Ahmed the Merchant, etc., etc. So in Another his detail. mind, I think there's that kind of warped sense of justice isn't there is um, that going to lead you on to your next quote I think it is I was going to say I, it's hard not to to pick on the other quotes that we've we've kind of chosen where he says justice snarled the ex-convict a pretty justice whose loot is this if not ours I think from this again we get this warped sense of justice he doesn't care for right or wrong he cares for vengeance as seen in the previous quote and for gaining what he sees as rightfully his. But what's, what he sees as justice, key quote, key word, has only been gained through criminal acts, which was part of our definition of what makes mm. a villain. He killed the merchant Ahmed. He has been a part of the death of... Um, Shalto. At least one Shalto. <laughs> At least one Shalto, yeah. Um, I think I'd the way two. I think the verb choice there, snarled, for the ex-convict is really key. We get a lot of animalistic description of Tonga, but I think it's partly quite animalistic there, almost like a a savage element of him that can't be held back. Uh, the anger and the violence and the and I think that phrase a pretty through. justice yeah. is interesting, isn't it? That kind of almost sarcasm in his voice. Conan Doyle's or... use of tone for Jonathan Small, I think, is key. It's all very sarcastic, as you say, but it's it's not just a, ha, 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 listen to my sarcasm. It's, it's a, he's tinged been wronged. with anger. Yeah. yeah, he views himself as a wronged man. I think, certainly, in our 2019 view of all of the events of uh, the sign of four we don't see him as a wronged person no i think and i don't know whether this is a bit of a spoiler for when we're going to go and talk on about our opinions later um but i see him as the key villain 
of the story. Second spoiler alert, me too. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Glad we're in agreement. <laughs> Should we talk about Tonga then as this kind of secondary villainous character? Because I think... I think we should because you've said they're secondary villainous character. I agree with you. And I wonder I whether a Victorian was, audience no. would have seen him as secondary. I think Arthur Conan Doyle, when he was writing, and I think people reading this when it was first published, would see Tonga as the villain. Yeah. And I think that's... I think that's what Conan Doyle wants us to think in the description of him. So do you want to start with one of the quotes or do you want me yeah, to start? Yes, so I'm going to give you a quote okay. about Tonga. Um, the way his appearance is described with features... Sorry, I didn't open my quotation marks. Open quotation marks. Features so deeply marked with bestiality and cruelty. Close quotation marks. Okay. I like this quote. I think there's a lot you can go into with this. I think start with the kind of bestiality because I think he's quite often referred to in animalistic terms I know we said that about small and also happens to Holmes as well interestingly but I think repeatedly Mm. Tonga gets these animal comparisons um, attributed to him and bestiality kind of goes beyond even it just being animalistic I think it's it's the idea of him being a beast this kind of uncontrolled character um, and the fact that his features are so deeply marked if you remember the marks of woe in London Mm. these kind of physical things that have become part of his person as well Um, and the cruelty there obviously could be this kind of idea that he has committed cruel acts and he is the character between him and Small that has maybe committed the most violent acts as well. Yeah, I think the difference between the comparisons to animals for Tonga and the comparisons to animals when it comes to characters like Sherlock Holmes is the fact that he's never made to seem more human than at that point. it's always... Whereas the others are. And it fits in with the description of people from the Andaman Islands just being savages. Yeah. And that's all they are, isn't it? I think when you look at the animals that Holmes is compared to, things like a hawk and a bloodhound, they're all these kind of more intelligent, mm. kind of more trainable animals, whereas Tonga often is compared to these kind of wild animals rather than something more kind of domestic. Okay, I'm going to give you another one that also brings in some more animal imagery. Um, So open quotation marks. It was that little hellhound Tonga who shot one of his cursed darts into him. Close quotation marks. Thank you for closing them. Uh, That's Jonathan Small talking, I believe. Well, I think that's important, isn't it? That even the character who is supposedly... the Well, no, I suppose Tonga's the companion of Jonathan Small, but they're closely tied together. They've been... I'm going to use the word in cahoots. They have been in cahoots. Throughout all the rest of this history we hear about, he just outright blames Tonga for the death of Bartholomew Sholto. They've been travelling around, accompanied one another. Um, Jonathan Small cared for Tonga. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, I think to a certain extent. Although he he also sold, like, kind of rented him out to... He made him better. He made him better. Yeah. I can't remember any more details other than that. Um, and Tonga's devoted to him, if we're to believe the yes. passage from the book about the Andaman Islands. And yet he still uses this animalistic imagery, this animalistic term, to refer to Tonga as a hellhound. Or not even a hellhound, little hellhound. He's demeaning him, I think. Um, taking away his humanity again. And then we see that Jonathan Small places all the blame for the death of Bartholomew Sholto on Tonga because it says Tonga shot one of his cursed darts into him. Mm. The darts, the murder weapons belong to him. They're cursed. Almost, do you think that's because he's from the Andaman Islands? Yeah, or I was looking at maybe linking that to hell as well, this kind of... It's like supernaturally evil, I would say. If you are to link it to Bartholomew Sholto's death where he's... It appears as though he's just suspended in midair, mm. and uh, Holmes says there's something devilish in this. Conan Doyle makes it seem through Sherlock Holmes and then through Jonathan Small here as though Tonga is a devil. Yeah. He's purely I, evil. I hadn't necessarily thought of this before when I've looked at that quote, but the repeated references to Tonga being little and the fact that he is described as this kind of childlike stature, mm. do you think that's an element of the uncanny that Conan Doyle's using yeah. in that? really someone small, someone childlike shouldn't be threatening yeah. and yet he is the most threatening character so there's that as kind of familiar yeah. unfamiliar, uncanny, unsettling 
image that we get of him or impression that yeah. we get of him. I agree. Shall we do our third villain? Yeah. Because I think this is one that probably you'd look at using if you wanted to have a slightly more kind of perceptive or a slightly different way into looking at the question. Or if you wanted to look at, develop your response by looking at all the different possibilities you could find throughout the novel. Also, I think if your main argument about Sign of Four and villainy in Sign of Four was that greed leads villainy, mm. I think this character you'd have to bring in. Yeah. So we initially thought about both Morstan and Sholto, but then we've narrowed it down to Sholto being the best candidate of the this two. This is Major for Sholto. Major, sorry to give him his correct title. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking Major otherwise. Sholto. Thaddeus and Bartholomew yeah. <laughs> gets very true. confusing with all the Sholtos yeah. in the in the tale. Major Sholto, you're right. Yeah. What can we say about him though? Because he actually isn't in the we don't the straightforward him, do narrative. We? No, in the he's, linear narrative. he's only heard of in flashbacks. Either in Thaddeus's sh- fl- slash black, slash black, fa- <laughs> flashback, Keep going. or in Jonathan Small's flashback, very long flashback, very long flashback. Um, he likes so, a tale. So I suppose we only get what other people think of him or what other people know of him, but it's enough to go on. Yeah, and I think. It- it's chapter three, isn't it, that Thaddeus talks about his father and this greed that his father has. In actual fact, in chapter three, I thought maybe a key quote for Major Sholto was Thaddeus flashing back to um, his father on his deathbed, telling him that his only regret was how he treated Mary Morstan and keeping the treasure from her. But then we get the part of that flashback where we see him say, open quotations, but send her nothing until I am gone, close quotation marks. Yeah, and I think that's a clever bit of foreshadowing from Conan Doyle in that we're getting these hints that Major Sholto is involved Mm. with this crime, with this kind of mystery that we've got in the opening of the novel. And obviously later we learn just how intrinsically linked he is to Jonathan Small's story, but also to the story of of the Agra treasure. Mm-hmm. Um, should we look at his how he kind of acts post? So J- Major Sholto takes the treasure, mm-hmm. makes the agreement with Small and Morstan when they're in the Andaman Islands, but but betrays them, doesn't mm-hmm. he? Doesn't help them escape. He runs off with the treasure, and then eventually, when Morstan comes to confront him, there's the kind of what some people interpret as slightly fishy death of Morstan, where Sholto claims that he has a heart attack and hits his head and, and dies. But on the treasure chest? On the treasure chest. Symbolic? I would say so. But um, I think there has been some classes that have shed doubt over this, and actually I think probably some character... Although they never seem to follow it up. They seem to kind of brush past it. But I think we're perhaps supposed to think um, Sholto had some kind he I certainly covered so. up Morstan's death you know? yeah and I think um, the fact that we're told his own devoted servant who helped him cover up Morstan's death thinks that he killed him yeah I think that's key and then lives in complete paranoia for the rest of his life doesn't he and I think that guilt mm. is probably tied up in the paranoia so another quote open quotation marks he fired his revolver at a wooden legged man who proved to be a harmless tradesman canvassing for orders close yeah. quotation marks well I think that's important when it comes to our definition of what makes a villain because I think we see no remorse he doesn't feel bad about his hand in stealing the treasure, betraying people. He's just concerned for his own safety, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think we saw that with, well, not his safety, but when he said, send Mary Morstan nothing until he's gone. He doesn't really regret, as far as I see it, how he's treated other people. No. He just feels selfishly like this is the kind of thing he should say or that he should defend himself, his money again, as he sees it. Um, so... I think the description there that's key is that this other wooden-legged man, even though we're told they are rare, (laughs) um, is described using the adjective harmless. And again, we don't get any sense of him feeling bad about that. He's just doing everything out of a sense of self-preservation. And I think when you look at Major Shalter in isolation in this way, some of Jonathan Small's lack of remorse at the end makes sense because what Jonathan Small has done, in a way 
is now different to what no. Sholto does. Um, Jonathan Small at the end of um, the novel talks about Major Sholto and says, open quotation marks, the villain Sholto went off to India but he never came back, close quotation marks. And also, open quotation marks, the scoundrel had stolen it all. And I think those names that Jonathan Mm. Small gives Sholto, villain and scoundrel, these kind of titles, very much put him on the same level as Small. And I think we are supposed to think that he's played a part in the evil acts Mm -hmm. in in the novel because he has the same greed, he has the same kind of self selfishness as Jonathan Small. So it's although Jonathan Small ultimately is the one that maybe commits the more evil acts, arguably, they have the same intent. And if we're looking at intent as one of the the markers of a villain, then I think Sholto has got it. Do you think it makes a difference, though, that we only hear about Major Sholto through Jonathan Small and that we do hear at least he tries to make some compensation to someone? And I suppose he pays for his kind of villainy, doesn't he? He does die. I suppose there's a certain justice in Sholto's death that we don't necessarily get with Small. I know he's captured, but he is alive by the end of the novel, at least. He's the only villain, really, that's alive. We think. We think. I mean, he is. <laughs> I really like the idea that Tonga's got his own sequel when he kind of yeah. emerges from the Thames, but we're pretty sure Tonga is dead. Should we narrow it down then to our, our biggest suspects, our yeah. biggest names? Yeah. Who Should we go from... So I think Sholto is our kind of third If villain. you're really wanting to push your answer In further, third push place. your thinking. Yeah. In third place, Major Sholto. Major Sholto. I think he's got the greed... I think he's got the intent and I think he's got the selfishness that makes a villain. In second place? Personally, and I Personally, think from what you were saying before... It's also Tonga. my opinion. Yeah. He undeniably does murder Bartholomew Schulte. <laughs> he does. He shoots him with a poison dart. It's quite a terrible thing to do. What a hellhound. He acts on instinct. Um, so we see his violent act uh he's obviously repeatedly described as a savage i'm not saying that's the right thing but, but we are told that's how he is and i think looking at it from a kind of victorian point of view and from conan doyle's point of view he is this other character that is different yeah. to and has this lack of kind of civilization attached to him that i think from the eyes of a victorian reader very much would make him a villain but but caveat um is he exploited by small yes 100 percent from actually no we should say this is from our perspective as readers in 2019 yeah we are able to see the difference between treatment of people from other places other cultures other traditions as being terribly terribly terrible yeah really that he's um paraded around he's <laughs> it's all i'm not laughing at it because it is so bad but I know. it's all this kind of he's unfairly targeted as this kind of minority isn't he well and... he's put on display a fair as the black cannibal yeah um made to eat raw flesh and dance for yeah. people that are just going to see him as entertainment to look at a man who looks different to them as entertainment. So contextually, we can see why yeah. Conan Doyle uses this kind of description. So are we saying that while he does commit evil acts, that he almost acts as this kind of scapegoat, perhaps? For yeah, small... because is it possible for him to have intent? Yeah, I, he's, not got, he's not going after anything for himself. He doesn't want the treasure. He doesn't have that greed that Small's got. He is just, as far as we are able to tell from the book, devoted to Jonathan Small and has, as far as Arthur Conan Doyle sees it, these savage instincts that he can't control. Yeah. So that puts in our top spot for villains, Jonathan Small himself. Ding, ding, ding. Congratulations, Small, come up and make a speech. Um, he's got the lack of remorse. Yeah. Um, he has a lack of care for the law. I think he even says, I think I've got it written down, I cared nothing for the law, that's a direct <laughs> quote. So he definitely doesn't care for the law. He's manipulative and exploitative of Tonga. 
he's another person that has greed for the riches, like an unbridled greed. And I know we talked a lot about Tonga's violence and a lot about Tonga's kind of um, killing. Um, he is Jonathan Small is directly involved in the killing of the merchant Ahmed, and arguably responsible for Major Sholto's death because yeah. he scares him to death. But also, wasn't there the man on the beach that he? Knocks over the head with his yes, own legs. He does also beat someone to death. So <laughs> glossed over, possibly because he's the narrator of this story. Yeah. Uh, or of the that his own story. Um but I would say that there is still some argument that Jonathan Ball could have a certain amount of sympathy or certainly he's no worse than certain other characters. I in suppose that because we are given the story from his perspective. Arthur Conan Doyle allows us to hear Jonathan Small's own words, whereas yeah. we've not heard anything from Tonga or Morstan. Oh, uh, Tonga. Shelter. He's got no voice. Well, I know, but we need to give Jonathan Small the benefit of the doubt now. Um, is he any worse than Sholto or Morstan or anyone else that's gone after the Agra treasure, other than that he is alive? No. I would say no. No. In a way, no. Yeah. Um, he also in a kind of warped way, has more loyalty yeah. than Sholto. No, I do agree with this. He, well, we know from the start of Mary bringing the case uh, to Holmes, don't we, that his name is always seen amongst the other names of the sign of the four. He does things as part of his loyalty to the other members of the sign of the four. Um, he doesn't betray them. Whereas... Sholto does. Yeah. So he could be seen as a victim of circumstance. And I think we get that in his narrative, don't we? He tells his story right from almost his birth yeah. up to the point that we, we meet him in the story and the kind of various different hardships that he's faced and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Technically, he was just a guard on the day that they were going after Ahmed the merchant. He's so. threatened with certain death if he doesn't agree to go along with their plan. And then obviously... After that, he kind of learns this thirst for vengeance and revenge. Is it, as I had the revelation of earlier, is it just that he is not just literally, but also symbolically getting more and more stuck in the mud with his wooden leg? Oh, I like that, because at the end of chapter 10, he does get stuck in the mud. And no matter how hard he tries to get out, he just sinks further and further. So he's our top pick for the big villain of the sign of four but is he just a misunderstood guy maybe (laughs) that'll be up for you to argue in your essay but i would recommend definitely looking at what makes a villain Mm -hmm. looking at how our different villainous characters whether that be sholto tonga or small fit into those categories of villainous behavior how you would um, explain Conan Doyle's choices in making them seem villainous or not villainous. Particularly in their physical descriptions, but also in the way that they describe their actions. Mm-hmm. And then try to, as we did, build up to your own personal opinion who you see as the most villainous in the sign of four. Enjoy!